Good morning. This is Dr. Rutledge, and uh, we're continuing our series of tapes on the actual details of performing the mini gastric bypass. Um, as we summarized before, uh, we think that it's important to recognize that the mini gastric bypass has risks just as all types of medical and surgical therapy. Um, we, that is the surgeons that have performed over a hundred mini gastric bypasses and many who have uh, just begun offering the mini gastric bypass are of just about uniform agreement <coughs> that the mini gastric bypass may be, in our opinion, the best form of weight loss surgery. But that doesn't mean that there's no risk. The <coughs> there is risk with the mini gastric bypass. The biggest risk that we see long term is the development of marginal ulcer and that's usually easily prevented by avoiding smoking, alcohol, uh, irritating um, foods and medicines and we particularly like to avoid soda pop and coffee. Uh, we especially think it's important to avoid NSAIDs and uh, we have more details on that on our other videos. But. As we talked about the other day, um, the patient comes into the operating room. We're going to talk about some of the details there. We want to talk about the uh, um, checklist to make sure the patient ID is done correctly. And there's a lot of research on this. So I won't spend too much time on the checklist and how valuable it is in the care of our patients. Um, as we talked about the other day, there's anesthesia, there's preparation, there's table positioning, the standing position of the uh, surgeon the assistant, the camera holder, and all those things. And at this point, we're beginning with the port placements. And uh, the other tapes talk about the earlier parts of the operation, the arrival of the patient, things like that. But today, we can imagine the patients have been identified, the checklist is completed, the uh, um, instruments have been checked, the sterility is checked, and uh, now the the uh, patient is prepped and draped, the table is maximum into reverse to Nellenberg and tilted left side up, so the patient has come to a near standing position. Um, the head is almost as high as the operating surgeon and the patient is almost looking directly at the, the operating surgeon. And this kind of tilting requires uh, immobilization adequately on the bed, which is not too hard as long as you are knowledgeable and to practice this and that's been our recommendation. But at this point let's imagine that we're about to operate. Um, the camera holder is ready. Uh, the camera holder being a mechanical steel bar, not a person. Uh, we have one assistant, uh, knowledgeable scrub tech where you've had a chance to huddle and talk about and discuss the details of the surgery with. And now we're going to place our ports. And the first port that we're going to place is the midline port for the camera. Um, two ways of placing this. Uh, one uh, older technique is the Varys needle. A uh, newer technique that I prefer is to use a busy port so you can see directly as you enter the abdomen. So you make the skin incision. And the location here is about one and a half palms down from the Zyphe sternum. Um, it sounds like a trivial issue, but placing these ports and allowing the angles to be correct means that the rest of the surgery will be easy. If you notice that you're struggling or the angles are incorrect, think that of the very first simple steps have been done incorrectly. And this is something that does take some time to get used to. But basically we're talking about one and a half palms, occasionally two palms for a taller person, occasionally one palm for a shorter person, but generally the distance um, that we like to say of the spread, kind of two finger breadths, uh, two fingers spread as far as you can, is about a palm and a half down. Uh, importantly, it's not the umbilicus, uh, that's a, especially the heavy person can drop down with paniculus, so we don't recommend that. Um, we go in carefully and meticulously, and once the camera is in, you look around to determine whether or not you have. Um, had an injury on entrance into the abdomen, and if this is the case, obviously it needs to be taken care of. Um, following this, you insufflate uh, the abdomen. Um, <clears throat> after insufflation, we're going to place the other four ports. So the total number of ports are five ports. For our American audience, we're going to essentially create a baseball diamond. And uh, the other four ports are all subcostal, usually about two to three. 
three finger breadths below the costal margin, and the ports begin uh, for this discussion in the uh, left axillary line of the patient, where we place a five millimeter port. Uh, and then all other ports used, including the camera port, need to be 12 millimeter ports. That is, all of the other ports must be able to accept the staple gun as well as the camera. And because we're going to be using each of those ports for the staple gun during the surgery, so we want to be mindful of that. All right, so let's think again. Uh, we're going to do uh, anterior axillary line, subcostal, on the left side. That's a five millimeter port. Next, we're going to go mid epigastric line, subcostal, left side, and that's a 12 millimeter port. Next is midline, subcostal, about two and a half finger breadths below the xiphi sternum, and that's a 12 millimeter port. And then between the left, the right axillary line and the right mid epigastric line, depending on the patient and how you view from the inside, one more 12 millimeter port. <clears throat> now, having placed those, we look around. probably not going to need a liver retractor. Uh, a lot of surgeons have a, a person plus a retractor and what we found is that usually not necessary even up to BMIs of 70 uh, with uh, careful use of the left hand uh, and retraction uh, that's usually unnecessary. So <clears throat> do an exploration look at the liver. Uh, it's important to note that if the liver is severely uh, damaged from fatty liver, scarring, with hepatic fibrosis and even frank cirrhosis, we'll want to change our approach. My advice in the event of severe liver disease is that we not do a mini gastric bypass because of the risk that rapid weight loss can occasionally lead to uh, liver failure and death. So our belief is that it's reasonable to do a modified version of the sleeve. The sleeve type surgery that I perform is what we call a mini gastroplasty and uh, it's based on the lesser curvature and it avoids some of the problems of the sleeve gastrectomy. It avoids gastroesophageal reflux and that's a discussion for another time. But most attractive of the mini gastroplasty over the sleeve is that it's reversible. Even a gastroplasty or a sleeve which have much, much less weight loss than a mini gastric bypass can lead to rapid weight loss and death in people with severe liver disease. So we believe that an irreversible surgery like the sleeve is tremendously dangerous in patients with advanced liver disease. Uh, any kind of rapid weight loss, whether or not it's associated with surgery, can lead to hepatic dysfunction and death. And so in the event of that, we would back off. Uh, now we're going to turn our attention uh, to the lesser curvature of the stomach, and it brings up a tip or a pointer where we know that some surgeons choose to quote, get the bowel first. And the idea behind that is what if we create a gastric pouch as we do for the mini gastric bypass and we're unable because of adhesions or other issues to get a loop of bowel that's amenable to gastrojejunostomy for the uh, mini gastric bypass. And uh, we believe that the getting the bowel out first uh, leaves a grasper and uh, making a mesenteric hole to put a uh, umbilical tape around it or a grasp or something like that, it just interferes with your attention in the left upper quadrant and making your gastric pouch. Uh, having done over 6,000 cases, I can tell you that the number of times in which you're unable to get a loop is very low, but even in the event that you're unable to uh, bring up a loop to do the anastomosis, it's very easy then as a fallback position just to do a gastro gastrostomy with the tip of your gastric pouch that creates what I call the mini gastroplasty and it's essentially the weight loss equivalent of a, of a sleeve and it's a good uh, first step procedure. And then in preparation the patient can uh, undergo the mild weight loss that occurs with a sleeve or a mini gastroplasty. Uh, usually diabetes gets better, there's some weight loss and you can plan to return in a year and do kind of a second stage if the patient wants more weight loss at that time you can be prepared for a couple of hours of dissection of adhesions if that's necessary and just uh, approach it from a different time with a healthier patient. Imagine that high blood pressure is resolved, diabetes is improved or resolved, uh, pulmonary functions improved or resolved, and so it's much more uh, appropriate to stage a patient if you can't get the loop. 
So again, the tip or pointer here is to remember you don't, in my opinion, get the loop first. Another thing you don't do, which we see some people do, is go up and dissect the hiatus. For goodness sake, what anything we've learned from the sleeve experience is staying away from the hiatus. Uh, recently, several publications have clearly identified that sleeves leak from the EG junction. Sleeves leak from the EG junction, 90 plus percent. And it's ironic that uh, sleeve doctors are busy worrying about reinforcing the staple line, whereas the whole staple line rarely leaks. The majority of the leaks are the EG junction when they go and, quote, skeletonize the esophagogastric junction. And in fact, in many surgeons' opinion, it's a badge of honor to meticulously skeletonize that area. Our bias is when you get near the esophagus with its two layers instead of its three-layer coat, you're likely, unfortunately, in one out of a hundred, or if you look at the German experience, up to eight out of a hundred patients are going to suffer injury and potential leak. Uh, it's happened, in my experience, with mini gastric bypass. It can happen if you dissect in that area. So, especially at this point, do not bluntly, sharply, or with any kind of electrical or other energy dissect in the area of the EG junction. It's unnecessary uh, for the mini gastric bypass. It may be necessary for the sleeve because they have the absence of a bypass. So to get effectiveness, they desperately need to avoid that proximal gastric pouch. But in dissecting in that area to avoid the pouch and making sure you have the maximum resection, unfortunately, you put your patient at risk for a leak and a leak after a sleeve, which has been shown is a devastating and deadly complication, often requiring three to six months in the hospital a stent and just something you want to desperately avoid because putting a hole in the GI tract is usually a minor issue. In other words, we put holes in the stomach and the bowel and the colon as general surgeons all the time. But then we repair the area, we staple it or sew it back up. The problem of the EG junction is not being able to recognize the area and in the event that you recognize it, repairing it, particularly because of the two coat esophagus is very difficult and sometimes, no matter what you do, impossible. So, stay away from the EG junction. Do not dissect the EG junction now or later, and we'll talk about it as we come to that area later in the case. So, it's very simple now. You put in a large grasper in the left lateral port. You put a regular, or what we call just a grasper, in the midline port and your right hand then operates with the harmonic scalpel or ligature or whatever um, type of dissecting tool that you use into the patient's left mid epigastric port. And you're working now through the midline and the mid epigastric ports. Those are your two working ports, left hand, right hand. And remember, that's gonna be very hard to do if the patient's supine. You want the patient tilted up and towards you so that you are not leaning over and not stretching out your arms. That's critical to make this an easy and simple operation. Now, with the large grasper in the left lateral port, you grab the stomach and retract it laterally. This exposes the lesser curvature and the crow's foot of the stomach. And here we begin to dissect this area. Again, some tips. Of, with the harmonic scalpel coming in through the mid epigastric port, the line of dissection often is parallel to the long axis of the patient and cephalad toward the head of the patient. This dissection, as it's carried towards the head, will lead you into branches of or to the actual left gastric artery. You don't want to be there. <laughs> I have been there, and even with a nice ligature or harmonic scalpel, the size of that vessel in the midst of a big fatty mesentery, and particularly in a difficult big man, can lead to significant problems, so stay away from it. So even though there's a natural kind of draw to pull you into a dissection along the lesser curvature, along the vertical stomach, up towards the EG junction, resist that and instead carry your dissection distal on the stomach, more along the horizontal portion of the stomach, and skeletonize and work towards the pylorus. Again, you want a long gastric pouch. Remember, we're going to be saying this over and over again. Uh, the Billroth II is a fine operation when it's placed after antrectomy. The Billroth II should never be placed when it's adjacent to the esophagus. So to get away from the esophagus and have a healthy, positive result from the MGB, the surgeon needs to have the wisdom 
from a hundred years of experience with the Bill Roth II. The Bill Roth II is not perfect, but it works very well when it's placed in the position of a gastrojejunostomy following antrectomy, that is with a long gastric pouch. There are articles in the medical literature where Bill Roth II results in gastritis and irritation, and many times that's because of a hemigastrectomy or even a two-thirds gastrectomy or a subtotal gastrectomy and a Bill Roth II. These will never work well. We know this from over 120 years, almost 150 years now, experience with the Bill Roth II. Placing a Bill Roth II adjacent to the esophagus always is a bad idea. And we see new MGB surgeons always making this mistake. So, from the very beginning, at the beginning of the surgery, remember, we want a long gastric pouch to avoid the problems of bile reflux, particularly bile reflux into the esophagus. When we have a long, narrow gastric pouch with a competent lower esophageal sphincter and a wide open gastrojejunostomy, the abdominal pressure will tend to close that just like a flat valve. And so that tends to protect the stomach and the esophagus from problems. But if there's a very short gastric pouch, everything goes out the window. Uh, again, this is a hundred plus years of experience. Don't forget that when you get in there to do a laparoscopic gastric bypass. Again, enough on that tip, but I can't emphasize that enough because the entire procedure will fail uh, to lead to a good, healthy outcome if you miss this issue. So again, you dissect the lesser curvature. We recommend that you really take some time to skeletonize this area because as a reminder, this is where you're going to be doing your gastrochagenostomy. I've operated with surgeons who say, I'm nervous about damaging the stomach, and that's certainly possible, but you want it skeletonized because if you leave behind a bulky, lesser curvature, fatty mesentery, um, you're going to be trying to do an anastomosis in that area. You may get bleeding, um, but in particular, if you're using sutures or staples, it's going to be hard to get accurate placement, and that um, residual fat can interfere with the anastomosis most dangerously, it may be hard to know exactly where you are, so you may get uh, an insecure anastomosis. So again, take your time here uh, and dissect this area. Usually this takes about five or so minutes. Once you're a skilled, uh, mature teen and a skilled and mature general surgeon, bariatric surgeon, able to handle this area, it's just a straightforward five minutes of your time. Clear it away and remember the tips we've talked about. Now we're going to create our stomach pouch. We're going to put the staple, take the harmonic or ligature out. Uh, we're going to change the grasper to the mid epigastric port. We're going to bring our staple gun in from the mid epigastric port. Now, uh, from when I watch other surgeons, they rarely do this. But when you bring it in from the midline port in the area of the xiphoid to get access to the crow's foot, you almost come down almost at a 45 degree angle, pointing down towards the left lower quadrant. What this does is extend the length of your pouch and give you a better anastomosis. So again, think about this. You're coming from midline down to the crow's foot, down towards the left lower quadrant. This creates an elongated gastric pouch. It should be at or below the junction of the body in the antrum. And this gives you that long pouch so that we get the anti-reflux effect of the long, narrow pouch and the flat valve effect. And again, we see that surgeons particularly are bringing, when they place the ports in different areas, they'll bring the staple gun in from below, and in bringing the staple gun in from below, you'll often sky close to the low, lesser curvature, sometimes unexpectedly, and what you're going to end up is kind of a bird's beak narrow tip and lose three, four, five, or more centimeters of gastric pouch because that tip isn't really useful, you end up anastomosis, and so your, the proximal portion of your anastomosis is not far at all from the ED junction. Again, forgive me for re-emphasizing, this is going to lead to all the problems of the critics of the MGB, and it's really because of not understanding what we're trying to do here. So, again, don't bring the staple gun in from below. Some people put ports down low, they have them coming in sometimes from the patient's left side, from low in the area of the camera or on the right side in the lateral. That's not what you want. You want to come down in and go 
towards the left lower quadrant coming in from above. And uh, that can be uh, some time learning that procedure, but it's critical and it gives you that good long gastric pouch that will serve the patient and serve you well. Um, you apply the staple gun, and now another tip. Uh, there are two kinds of, two main companies that provide staple guns. One is Covidian, the old U.S. Surgical, and uh, Ethicon, Johnson & Johnson. And uh, both of these are slightly different. Now what we want to do is fire a staple line. We want it secure, <clears throat> and we'd also like it to be hemostatic. So there are a bunch of issues as far as choosing the staples. So the staple closure height is very important to understand and how you choose that and what the tissue is like. And so there's some real knowledge there and tips and pointers to talk about. Plus we want to talk about in detail how to place it and particularly we want to talk about patients. Um, with the Ethicon staple gun, what we want to do is apply it and then wait anywhere from one to five minutes. Now this sounds heretical, the surgeons can't wait one to five minutes. But there's a tremendous advantage for compressing the tissue that long period of time because it acts as direct pressure and it helps decrease the bleeding from the staple line. For the Covidian stapler, the compression doesn't occur until you actually start to fire it. So my recommendation, based on advice from the company representatives, is you advance the stapler a little bit, that is you begin to fire it, and then wait. And go very slowly because as the little trolley, as I call it, uh, moves along, the pressure is going along with it. And there's some pressure ahead of it and some pressure behind it. And so you want a minutes of compression as you move down that staple line so you get the maximum compression. The other thing is I believe that there's some real advantages to the new purple uh, multi-staple height cartridge from Covidian. Um, but I think uh, any of the company staplers can be effective. <clears throat> the critical factor is knowing how to use it. Um, so that's this morning's discussion and uh, we'll talk further as we get the MGB underway. I hope you're enjoying this and uh, we'll talk again tomorrow. Thank you very much.